Fishing, hunting, wildlife management, resource protection, habitat conservation, public outreach, and education. It's what we do. It's what we live for. Simply put, conserving wildlife literally means the wise use of wildlife. And that's at the root of everything we do. <laughs> Oklahoma is one of the most species diverse states in the nation. making sure opportunities exist for hunters, anglers, and all those who appreciate wildlife is not only our job. It's our passion. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. From sunup to sundown, and sometimes all night long, the employees of our agency are relentless in their dedication to a job well done. The science behind wildlife conservation is constantly evolving, and our biologists are leading the way with groundbreaking and cutting-edge techniques that the entire scientific community benefits from. If that's not enough to make you proud, then consider this. We've been doing all this since our agency's birth in 1909, without using a dime of taxpayer money. That's because the Wildlife Department is designed as a user pay, user benefit agency. It's sportsmen and wildlife enthusiasts who pay the bill for wildlife conservation in Oklahoma. Revenue from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses make up the majority of the agency's budget. There's also another unique way that outdoorsmen contribute financially. Each time someone buys a gun, ammunition, fishing equipment, or fuel for their boat, a small portion of the tax they pay at the register is used for wildlife conservation. 
but hunters and anglers don't just contribute financially. A long time ago, we recognized that sportsmen are our most effective management tool. Shaping regulations and making sure everyone complies to them has played a major role in bringing many species back from the brink of extinction. to unimaginable numbers. As much as the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation has accomplished, we are positive our agency's best days are yet to come. You can see it on our faces. You can feel it with your hands. And you can hear it on the landscape. You'll find us working hard to make your state's natural resources the most healthy in the land. We are. We are. We are. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Fishing, hunting, wildlife management, resource protection, habitat conservation, public outreach, and education. It's what we do. It's what we live for. Simply put, Conserving wildlife literally means the wise use of wildlife. And that's at the root of everything we do. If you would please take your seats. Call to order the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation Commission meeting this morning, uh, this first day of March 2021. Please have a roll call. Commissioner Brewster? Here. Commissioner Barwick? Here. Commissioner Hughes? Absent. Commissioner Gaddis? Here. Commissioner Zelt? Here. Commissioner Dillingham? Here. Commissioner Holder? Here. Commissioner Mabry? Here. If you would please stand for the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Mr. Bill Dinkins. If you will, do the introduction of guests, please. Yes, Mr. Chairman. So with us today and also on the agenda is Peter Churchborn from the National Rifle Association. Thank you for being here. Uh, Laura McIver from Quail Forever. Surprise, surprise that she's with us this morning. Rick Grunman from the Wildlife Foundation. Everybody else 
in the crowd um, works for you. So. At this time, we're going to have an update from Governor Stitt's administration with uh, Lieutenant Governor Matt Pinnell. He's not here with us this, this morning. He's out on the road, I believe, but our director, J.D., should uh, yeah, be so connecting with him. Yeah, so we're going to go high-tech this morning and remote in the Lieutenant Governor on my speakerphone up to a mic. So, uh, Lieutenant Governor Matt Pinnell, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, J.D. Uh, at least I'm not trying to Zoom somewhere right now. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, just a couple minutes just to, uh, to say hello and uh, very excited, as you all uh, probably have seen, uh, uh, there's uh, with the governor's cabinet, uh, uh, some secretaries, we have some new secretaries on the cabinet. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still on the cabinet, but with a new secretary role, still over, still secretary of tourism, uh, but have added wildlife uh, to my secretary duties. Uh, JD and I have, have worked very closely together the last couple of years, uh, just partnering where uh, it made sense to partner. And uh, certainly look forward to working with uh, you um, and uh, the individuals uh, that, that I'm speaking to right now on, on ways that I can continue to help and reinforce Great Oklahoma Outdoors and, and the issues that you have at the Capitol as well. So um, with that, again, I, I will be at an in-person meeting. I, I, J.D. and I are talking, I believe it's the April meeting uh, that, uh, that I'm going to be able to be there in person at uh, so where, where we can talk. We can uh, certainly, uh, we'll have a much better opportunity to have a, a, a dialogue about different issues. Uh, and I hope to see a few of you at the uh, Lieutenant Governor Turkey Hunt uh, in April, uh, which is probably the best economic development event that we have in the state of Oklahoma. Um, we bring in a lot of site relocation firms and uh, economic development uh, related organizations around uh, the country and world, frankly. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope to hope to see you hope, hope to see a few of you at uh, at my hunt uh, in mid April as well. With that, JD, I'll hand it back over to you. If there are any questions, I can uh, try to answer if we can do it this way. Great. Well, it's definitely the most fun economic development tool in the state, the Lieutenant Governor's Turkey Hunt. So, yes. Um, and like Lieutenant Governor Pinnell said, he uh, I believe he'll be able to make the April meeting, be here in person, that sort of thing. Um, with the cabinet reorganization or, or some additional responsibilities shuffling around just kind of late last week. It w there wasn't time to get in before the commission right away this morning. So um, thus the, the speakerphone approach, but. Yeah, well, I'm in, uh, I'm in Ardmore, America today. All right, Carter County. Um, any questions for now? Doesn't appear so, so um, good luck down in uh, Ardmore, and we'll look forward to seeing you in April, if not sooner. You will, absolutely, yeah. Uh, J.D., give them my email address as well and my cell phone number. Um, I, I'm, uh, give, give them all my information in case they, they want to have conversations between now and that board meeting. We will do that. Excellent. There's not a whole lot of a whole lot of uh, commissions that I'll give my cell phone number. This is definitely one of them. This is that that group right there is definitely one that I want to have my cell phone number. Awesome. All yeah. right, we'll hit that fishing trail. We'll see you soon. See you guys. Appreciate it. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you, JD, for that presentation. Uh, at this time, your agenda uh, item number seven: presentation of awards. to the next page okay can you hear me so we have one up um, today for recognition and that is um, Kristen Gilman who is our wildlife lands and minerals coordinator who started with the department in January of 2001 as an INE specialist so um, she in uh, September 2012 uh, was hired on to be the lands and minerals coordinator for uh, for the department, and so a lot of the uh, 
mineral leases and land acquisitions and all of those sorts of things, easements across the property and all those sorts of things that um, we bring to you and deal with um, come from Kristen's fine handiwork. Kristen is a third generation graduate from Oklahoma State University with a BS in, uh, and this is a pistol peat mask if you didn't, if you thought it was something different. Uh, with a degree in wildlife ecology and a uh, minor in range management, my exact same degree uh, that she got in 98, and a master's in information management. I did not get that degree. Um, during her tenure, she's helped coordinate the purchase of over 37,000 acres, resulting in five new WMAs, which are Buckle Springs, Sand Hills, Sand Boy, Neosho, and Bamberger as well as additions to 15 WMAs and the Durant Hatchery. She has been instrumental in implementing the new land as match opportunity that we talked about, I believe, at the last commission meeting, using Sandy Sanders' existing property as, uh, as match for acquisition of more. Uh, Kristen plays a very active role on the Wildlife Management Area um, Steering Committee, um, our internal charitable team and our state charitable campaign, she basically leads for us. Uh, the Oklahoma Natural Resources Conference Executive Board, as well as many other committees too numerous to list. And I'll add uh, that she also took it upon herself to either lead or be engaged in a lot of our high priority strategic plan implementation teams too. So I honestly don't know how Kristen um, handles all of the um, land and minerals work that she does since she um, does such a great job volunteering in a lot of other areas. She's been a member of the Wildlife Expo planning team since its inception in 2005, taking on the most eclectic array of responsibilities as well as volunteering for anything and everything that needs to be done. She is well respected in the Expo world and everybody knows she will always go above and beyond what is asked of her. She coordinated the writing and compiling of the, um, the NERDA proposal, where we received several million dollars from the Secretary of Energy and, and Environment's office, uh, which also paired with our PR grants resulted in the acquisition of four million dollars worth of equipment and three and a half million dollars in habitat improvement. So it's quick uh, to see, and that's just a quick summary, uh, how invaluable Kristen is to us in the department and uh, we just appreciate Kristen and your 20 years of service with the department. Kristen. Uh, JD, JD, if, if I might, I'd like to congratulate uh, Kristen personally. I worked extensively with her on land acquisition. She's a pleasure to deal with and a very valuable asset to your team. So keep her happy. Amen. <laughs> Mike is all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Barwick. That was very nice. Um, I greatly appreciate this honor. It's amazing how fast 20 years has gone, and my, all my success is attributed to the team, my coworkers, my family, my friends. So it took it takes everybody to be very successful. So I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> item on the agenda is uh, item number eight, consideration and vote to approve the men and reject or take other action on the minutes of the February 1st meeting 2021, our last regular commission meeting. Motion. Second. 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 Discussion? Roll call, please. Commissioner Brewster? Aye. Commissioner Barwick? Aye. Commissioner Gaddis? Aye. Commissioner Bell? Aye. Commissioner Dillingham? Aye. Commissioner Holder? Right. Next item on the agenda is the uh, director's report. J.D. Strong. J.D. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I ask um, Corey to come up maybe and give us an update on the legislative front, um, now that we've got the first deadline, legislative deadline behind us, uh, and have a better feel for um, what is active and what is inactive out there. I'll just mention you also have Brittany Preston's report from things that are going on at the federal level there. Um, most of it's heavy on impeachment and stimulus package stuff, so not a lot happening on, on the wildlife front, at least um, that 
is visible. Uh, obviously, we continue to work with um, our um, national organization, AFWA, and a number of our partners at the national level, both NRA and Quail Forever here, as well as many others, to continue to work on Recovering America's Wildlife Act, see if we can get traction on that again this session, uh, as well as a number of other things. The only thing to point out towards the end of her report is um, the new Biden administration put a delay on a, a rule that was kind of rushed through late in the Trump administration on um, pretty wide exemptions from the Migratory Bird Treaty Act for incidental take. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of watch. Most of the state wildlife agencies expressed concern about that proposed rulemaking to begin with. So we'll see what happens there. But let's talk about what's happening across the street, Corey. Yeah, so JD mentioned um, we hit our first deadline last week. And unfortunately, the Senate actually extended one of their deadlines. So they haven't killed their bills off quite yet. So I don't know what's going to drop off. Um, but on the House side, they went down, um, I think they're down to about a quarter of the bills that they filed. So it will clean up the list um, a lot. And I'm, I'm thinking the Senate's probably going to end up with quite a few knocking off um, the plate as well. Um, I'm just going to run through this list real quick. Uh, we have House Bill 1112, which is our request bill, along with some constituent groups. And that's our bill that moves fur, bearer, fur bearing trapping out of statute and allows you guys to manage that by rules. Um, passed out of committee. It's ready to be heard by the whole House. Uh, 1768 is our request bill to reauthorize our tax checkoff. Also passed out of committee with no issue and will be, it's actually on the agenda potentially for today to be heard by the whole House. Um, House Bill 1986 was amended a couple times. This um, originally and still would require state agencies with grazing properties to just fence those areas where they graze cattle. Um, it, it, looking at it, it's essentially what we already do on our properties, so it doesn't really have too many concerns for us. Um, it passed out of the Ag and uh, Rural Development Committee and is available for the whole House to consider. Then 2214, this is our big request bill that moves licensing out of statute and allows us to um, promulgate rules to create licenses and fees. Um, we've had a little bit of uh, <laughs> a long road with that one already. Uh, it was amended twice in committee. Um, so this bill actually includes language um, that would make us wait six months for a, a property to be listed on the market before we can purchase it. Um, it also added some provisions where if we want to use our wildlife land funds for um, county road improvements and fencing, we can do that. That was something that's um, been a concern of some of the members and it, it doesn't necessarily require us to do that. It just provides that option. Um, so a couple changes there. It took out a couple of the licenses that we sell. So not everything would necessarily move out of statute. Um, so there's a lot that changed with that bill, but it still is overall um, the big concept of moving things out of statute. So with that, it did pass out of committee um, and can be heard by the House. Um, and the, I think it's probably got to sit for a couple days. So we'll keep working on that one. Um, 2778 was the DA bill, just um, allows them to get rid of old court cases. No big deal, that one's passed. Um, we haven't heard the House resolution, uh, the public lands House resolution quite yet. I think they're scheduled to hear that later this month. Um, on the Senate side, we have another request from the state courts um, or the DAs uh, that just allows physical records to get destroyed after a certain amount of time that's passed. And I'm gonna skip down to the ones that are still alive. Um, so we still have that mountain lion bill that would create a lottery for mountain lions. Um, it is still alive. We've been told that it's probably not gonna move anymore, but it, it did get out of committee, so it could get pulled up on the house if um, Senator Murdoch chose to do that, but I think he is willing to work with us on that one. Uh, Senator Stevens has Senate Bill 770, which is our Senate version of the Wildlife Diversity Tax Checkoff Reauthorization that passed out of committee and is ready to get heard on the floor. Um, let's see, 772 is the coyote hog night hunting provision that allows um, landowners with agriculture properties to deal with nuisance coyotes and hogs at night without getting a permit from us. Um, but it also, as a compromise, 
increases night hunting penalties uh, pretty substantially. So um, we are working with Senator Murdoch and Representative Newton on that one um, and think ultimately it's probably gonna end up being a, a good deal for us. And that one passed out of committee, can be heard by the uh, full Senate. Uh, 773 is prairie dog season, um, but not season so much. It, it essentially would just make it where people that want to deal with nuisance prairie dogs don't have to have a license. Um, we're again working with Senator Murdoch on that one. It passed out of committee. Um, we're hoping it doesn't have a huge impact on licensing. Um, prairie dogs uh, are pretty wide open already, and so we'll continue to work with Senator Murdoch on that and see if we can find some common ground there. 774, and I think probably the version that I gave you guys a copy of has all the live bills, and I think the one I have just has um, got rid of the dead bills too, so I'm probably skipping past some that are also on your list. 774 is our Senate version of the license bill. Um, title is off on this, and it did pass out of committee. Uh, we will work with Senator Murdoch on a couple amendments um, on that one, but probably not to include all the ones on the House side, so it will just be a couple fixes to address some concerns from senators to make sure they know rules have to come back to the legislature. Um, that's already a law, but we'll just kind of reiterate that in, in the Senate bill, so Senate members that had concerns about Losing authority, um, we can just re-articulate that in the bill, as well as fixing some effective dates so we don't lose licensing before we can get rules in place, which is a pretty important part. So we'll work with him on that one, um, but it does still have title off, so we got a little bit of process um, to deal with for that one to move forward. 776, um, it was originally a bill that was basically net neutral. We can't buy more land unless we sell more land or leased or have donated. It was pretty um, broad reaching. He amended that in committee, so it is only um, a restriction on uh, the six months where it has to be listed on the market before we can buy it. Uh, there were some concerns and some issues with the amendment um, and the way that it was written. It didn't exempt leases, um, and then some other folks uh, would like exemptions for um, donated land, and so he's gonna amend that uh, before it goes to the floor. Uh, where it's just purchases have to sit on the market for six months. Senate Bill 812 is another, uh, this is the state courts one, where basically um, somebody has to surrender their license or it's being revoked and the game warden is at the court hearing, they can just hand it to the game warden rather than mail it to us. So housekeeping change um, that we're perfectly fine with. Senate Bill 829 um, is another fence bill. This one's a little bit different. Um, the latest amendment is actually maybe a good thing for us. It requires state agencies with grazing properties to fence the perimeter of those properties. Um, of course, originally, if you have to fence the whole property, that could come at a huge cost to us. Um, however, he added in this amendment that we'd be exempt from the Central Purchasing Act, um, which sometimes actually increases the cost of building those fences. So we'll continue to watch it and see how it moves, but um, it's actually scheduled this morning for a committee hearing in the Senate. So we'll see if it, it continues to move, but it actually doesn't just impact us. I know it impacts other agencies and that's maybe the intention. So we'll see, um, but that exemption from the Central Purchasing Act would maybe be helpful for other purposes. And it is only for fencing material, it's not for everything, just to be clear. Uh, Senate Bill 839 uh, would prohibit game wardens from placing cameras on private property without permission of landowner and with a valid warrant. So Senator Dom did work with us to make sure that if there's a warrant and there's a need to do that under a court order, we can do that. Um, so we amended it, passed out of committee, um, and it can be heard on the floor at any time. And of course, that's usually a process that um, we already follow. It is always a process that we already follow. Um, Senate Bill 964 would have allowed um, officers to, or would have prevented officers, not just game wardens, from entering lands without landowner permission. Um, this one did not get a hearing, so it's actually dead. I'm wondering if I'm missing a few things from my list here, but um, that one did not, it's, it's dormant for the rest of the session, so it can't get pulled up again. Um, and then we have a few resolutions. So um, the Nature Conservancy has been moving ahead with a public lands resolution. They've had to change the number a couple times. Um, 
On the Senate side, there were concerns, um, a little bit of pushback on the public lands issue in general, and so they tweaked the language and basically took out the words public lands, but acknowledge, um, I don't know what words they use, but public spaces, whatever. Um, so they, they refiled a, a version of that, and it's Senate Resolution 8, which is actually the one that they're gonna pursue moving forward, so, and I think they have support to do that. But that's it. Any questions? The next two weeks are floor work, and then we're back in committees and moving fast already. It's March. It always moves fast. Yeah, lots to cover there. Any questions about that before I dive into the rest of the director's report? Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. So Corey's obviously been busy um, over at the Capitol. Also, uh, Human Dimensions work is under her bailiwick. Um, so you can see we're in the midst of the 2020 game harvest survey right now. Um, and started surveying residents down in the Arbuckle area about uh, prospective elk reintroduction program. So we'll be talking a little more about that as, as we move along, but uh, this is basically a survey just to kind of see what um, landowners and residents down in that part of the state think about the concept of reintroducing wild elk to the Arbuckles, which could be a potential project for us moving forward. So stay tuned on that. Um, you can see more fish stockings occurring, uh, lots of work going on, Watonga Dam, Manning Hatchery, um, Lake Elmer, um, on and on. Additional fish attractor sites uh, refurbished. Um, the um, so lots of the, the kiosk, the information kiosks were refreshed on the lower Mountain Fork uh, trout area, just to reflect the new regulations that the commission passed um, last year. Um, so lots going on in um, fisheries division, in C and E division, no longer I and E, communications and education division. Um, lots of things going on there. You will see kind of the rationale behind the division name change to communication. Um, and I think that it's a, it's a wise change at the end of the day because it does sort of connote two-way active communication, which is what we always want to um, try to, to um, facilitate here at the agency, not just us pushing information out, but us actually listening and, and um, adjusting and adapting to what our constituents would like to see as well. So great job to Nels and the gang on uh, agonizing a bit over that entire name change thing, but ultimately deciding to, to pull the trigger. And also, while I'm thinking about it, a um, couple of things hot off the presses you may have seen, if, if you and you hopefully saw, if you get our emails or follow any of our social media accounts, you will have seen that about nine or ten days ago, we launched an all-new um, set of raffle hunts, um, fishing opportunities, and uh, other outdoor adventures. Um, and so just in the last nine days uh, that that's been launched, and you can see it on the front page of our website, and, and hopefully you've had a chance or will have a chance to go jump on that web, web page and see. I think our staff did a great job of packaging those things up and, and, and preparing them for some marketing, but just since that has opened up, we've um, had roughly $27,000 in raffle tickets bought already, uh, and this will be promoted between now and, and August. Um, we'll, of course, promote it big time during our regular controlled hunt sign-up period. We'll look for opportunities to cross-sell as people are checking out on licenses or merchandise. We'll have a pop-up screen. Hey, go check out um, these raffle hunt opportunities. But interestingly, it's the, um, the, what the individual experience that has generated the most interest so far is the Southwest Oklahoma cow elk hunt. Um, thank you, Commissioner Zelks, for that one. And then... <laughs> yeah, he knows the numbers. And, uh, and then the, the one that is overall generating the most money is the five ticket or the uh, ultimate bundle. So 
Uh, for 50 bucks, I think it is, you can put in for all the raffle opportunities. But we've got um, bear biologist uh, for a day is in there. Um, tag along with it, an employee of the day. I already saw some chatter on Facebook about people wanting to get the opportunity to spend a day with me, and I don't think it's in a positive way. So, um, so we'll see how that all goes. But um, snorkeling for fish, you know, with the fisheries biologists, uh, there's some cool opportunities to do that. Alligators in uh, McCurtain County, um, and birding with one of our many birding experts that we have. I'm going to miss out, but of course, those are all on top of the hunting and fishing opportunities that we have out there as well, whether it's fishing with Jimmy Houston or snagging for a record um, paddlefish on Keystone and um, turkey hunts. And we had a lot of uh, uh, kind donations from our commissioners, and we appreciate you all for that, as well as uh, some of the outfitters around the state. So um, $27,000 and nine days in, and um, so we're looking forward to uh, seeing how this goes. And then, of course, uh, with another year to plan, um, putting, I know staff's already working on putting together some even bigger and better um, hunts and, and fishing opportunities to come. So stay tuned for more on that. Last week was, um, again, this one's not in the director's report because it's late breaking, but um, we had virtual rack madness last week. And while it wasn't as mad as having everybody packed in here like a hive of bees, um, we did have a week-long, mostly um, virtual or very virtual experience uh, with folks, and we saw a 120% increase in Instagram traffic. That's where we streamed a lot of uh, live videos and events. Um, Wade's scoring video had almost 4,000 views, so good job, Wade. We'll, um, we'll be needing to get his um, autograph. And uh, it took 800 votes each day to win in, in the brackets. We kind of had a, a March Madness basketball style um, bracket competition with people voting what they thought was um, the best buck to advance to the next level and that sort of thing. So a lot of fun. I appreciate everybody. A lot of hard work went into that uh, effort as well. Um, it's kind of all hands on deck like it usually is for March Madness, except it was all online, and and so thanks to everybody for that. Um, I will, in the interest of time, since we have um, a lot of rules to go through, just pull out maybe a couple of things. Um, continuing in with um, you know shooting competitions, I was able to drop in on the archery state shoots last week, the Oklahoma City Fairgrounds. Much different than years past when you walk in there and it sounds like hail on the roof at the, when they're just letting those arrows fly, but it was a much more socially distanced and, and a fewer number of teams were actually invited to the state shoot so they could manage it, but um, Lance and the gang did a great job, um, Kelly uh, and others of, of managing that shoot and um, always a humbling experience for me to go see how many they can put in the 10 ring um, out of that competition. So good stuff. And this year, um, Lone Grove was, or Locust Grove, Locust Grove was um, bumped out for the first time in many years by Altus, if I remember. Really? Well, there you go. Well, Altus toppled the uh, longtime king of that. And um, so great competition. Uh, the, the Scholastic Shooting Sports Regional Shoots are going to be taking place through March uh, with that state shoot happening at the uh, Oklahoma Trap Association um, out near uh, Banner on April 7th. So um, lots of good things going on in C&E C &E Division. I'll let you kind of read through that for yourself. Lots of, uh, they've been doing a bang-up job recently too of putting in for these grants at the national level that are really helping us advance the ball when it comes to R3. And, and I know they got a um, George Bush Vamos a Pascar um, grant to um, partner with a local Latina group. 
Um, we did get that award, didn't we? Okay, just making sure that's still public information at this point. Oops. But yeah, so that'll be an interesting one for us to be able to branch out on the kind of the diversity side of things and see if we can work with, partner with um, a local Hispanic organization to get um, more um, Hispanic women engaged in fishing. So looking forward to that. Um, wildlife Division, um, after some assessment, both fish and wildlife, um, the damages from Siberia week were not too great across our facilities. There are a few exceptions to that, but it certainly could have been a lot worse. Um, and so you'll see there the elk hunts wrapped up in the Wichita Mountains, 72% success rate. That's uh, pretty high um, by anybody's standards. The experimental walk-in hunts were very successful, and that was part of the expanded opportunity that Fish and Wildlife Service provided for us in ex expanding hunting and fishing in the refuges. Um, stay tuned for turkey winter flock surveys that are underway. Hopefully we'll see some good news there, but you never know. Um, and then I'll end with law enforcement there. You can kind of see um, we've got four openings to be filled in the coming months. You can see where those are. Uh, and I'm sure those folks will welcome having those folks on board as soon as possible. We'll, we'll be hosting our second annual Game Warden Academy this year to kind of have our own tailored training program for those new Game Wardens. Five weeks of instruction um, likely held at Camp Gruber where they did last year. So um, I know Nate and Wade and Marnie do a great job um, organizing and putting those together. Um, and I think I will stop there and just see if there are any questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, J.D. Appreciate that information. Very good. Again, item number 10 will be a presentation of the January 31st, 2021 uh, financial statement. Amanda Stork. Amanda. Good morning. Looking at me. All right, today I have for you the financial statements for January 31st, 2021. So this is July 1, 2020 through January 31st, 2021. Um, the combined balance sheet for all fund types and account groups, we have a liability and fund balance of 472 million. $235,286 with total liabilities totaling $20,299,223 for a total fund balance of $472,235,286 compared to last year $426,980,161. Our trust fund balance as of January 31st, 2021, and the expendable trust is $31,217,756. Our non-expendable trust is $95,269,683. Our pension trust is $133,153,936. And our DC trust is $4,858,503 for a total of $264,499,878 compared to last year of $238,698,635. On page three is the combined statement of revenue expenditures and changes in fund balance. Through January 31st, our total revenue is $32,332,879 Total expenditures of $31,591,623 with an excess of $741,256 and our fund balance as of January 31st of $53,242,095. On our trust fund combined statement revenue and expenditures and changes in fund balance we have um, expendable portion of the trust of 
$2,789,789. Our total operating revenue is $23,280,301. Our total operating expense is $5,123,743. And our operating income is $18,156,558. Our total wildlife contributions report for January 2021 is $205. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Amanda? And I'll just say quickly, um, our February license sales are down in all categories. Um, we can expect that to be mostly related to um, weather. Um, but also some early renewals, so we hope that that will increase in March. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody from the floor? If not, I'd ask for a motion to uh, to approve the financial statement as well as the financial donations. Motion. Second. Discussion. Being none. Roll call. Commissioner Brewster. Aye. Mr. Barwick. Mr. Gaddis? Aye. Mr. Zelt? Aye. Mr. Gillingham? Aye. Mr. Holbert? Aye. Mr. Mabry? Aye. Oh. Next item on the agenda is a um, resolution recognizing the National Rifle Association for their development of an online education course. Nails? <coughs> Commissioners, um, you're going to hear from Lance about our hunter education program here in a minute and, um, and about why we feel it's been innovative and progressive. I'm going to leave that to him, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Lance. Lance started with the department in 2002 um, and is truly an open-minded employee who focuses on the customer experience without foregoing safety. He, um, he understands that the state-run hunter education program is a starting place to a journey of safety and not a certification of safety. In addition to um, his ongoing hunter education program management, he has started two other programs or efforts that are or will be soon run independently by um, an additional FTE, those programs being the National Archery in the Schools program and um, our shooting range renovation and construction efforts. So Lance is truly a cowboy who rides for the brand. And with that, I give you Lance Meek. That, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said about me, including my family members. <laughs> Especially including family members. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Nels. Um, yeah, I'm just here to tell you, I'm going to give you a real brief history of the program. I'm, I keep this as short as we can. Uh, talk about some of the things we've done that we were first or among the first in, and then we're going to talk about a, a partner of ours that really, really helped our program a lot. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Okay, um, you know, hunter education started in Oklahoma. I think the earliest part I can find was 1958. It was a completely volunteer program back then. But if you get to talking about anybody who, who's in the know... About you may have to get in front of the mic just because we're streaming. Sorry. Very sorry. Sorry. Um, if you get to talking to anyone about hunter education for very long, they will bring up that hunter education is a barrier. When I started this job 19 years ago, that was one of the first things that um, Nels and Colin and, and the people in, in ComEd now um, told me is we're going we're gonna to keep this, we're going to not look at this a barrier, we're going to make it a recruitment tool. And uh, we, I, I feel like we've, um, we've made a lot of steps along there. Um, so one of the things we've done is we've always been free. There's a lot of states where you have to pay for either an online or an in-person class always free in Oklahoma, and I believe that will always remain that way. Um, our classes are available as an eight-hour uh, in-person class, but also we recognize that doesn't fit into everyone's schedule, 
You can do it as an online course, completely online, or you can complete a home study class, and that's where you go to uh, you go to the class for about four hours, and then they send you home with uh, some paperwork, and, and you fill out the worksheet. Actually, you do the worksheet first, and then you come to four hours of class, and we certify you there. You get to learn at your own pace. Um, our courses have always been taught by our game wardens, our volunteers, or other department staff. We uh, go, to, we put people through a certification process, and uh, we do about 13,000 students per year. Some years there's incredible spikes. The year we first went online, we went up to like 17,000. So, um, one of the things we've done is we were among the first to offer the home study option. This was probably 2001, 2002. And the, the neat thing about home study is it took the class from, it, the course was actually 10 hours at that time. So it took the class from a 10 hour thing, I mean, think about a 10 hour Saturday or trying to split 10 hours up into two evenings and make it work for your students that in, in your community. This really give, gave our game wardens and other instructors a lot of flexibility. So you come in for, uh, some, some would have you come in for two hours, go do the work, come in back in for two hours. But it really just, the, the point is flexibility. Then, I hate to say Texas beat us to this, but we were second. Um, the, we, we came out with the apprentice designated license and that basically gives a hunter in the field an opportunity to get out and sample hunting without tech completing hunter education. Um, they do have to be accompanied with big game. They have to actually be sitting close enough for that person to take the firearm away. And, and as we move through these things, we really, we, we focus on making things convenient, but we also keep safety at the top of priority. And um, personally, I like the idea. I like the idea of an 11-year-old, even if they've passed the course, I like the idea of them sitting next to somebody right there. Um, since we were upset about being second on this, we were the first state to offer it for free as many times as the hunter wants. Texas has a two-year limit and charges the, charges the person. We want to get people in the field. Um, and then in 2013, we became the first state to offer it to any age. When I started this course, probably the average age of our, when I started this job, the average age of our students were 12 to 14, and it started getting smaller and smaller. People wanted their younger, younger students to go hunting. Also, there are some students um, with developmental problems or things like that who are just never going to get to pass the course, and this gives an opportunity for those people to get out in the field. It's really neat. Um, then around 2005, it took us till 2007 for it to come out, around 2005 we decided we would produce our own hunter education manual for a variety of reasons. One of the great benefits that came out of this though was $4.50 a copy, folks. This was, this was back in 2006, 2007. We were spending $4.50 a copy. When we created our own curriculum, we went down to $0.53 cents a copy because all we had to do was get it printed. I did the math, not for you guys, because I'm lousy at math, but that's $90,000 we saved every year. <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, $80,000 we saved every year. See, I told you I'm not good at math. <laughs> uh, so one of the really neat things, we took that money and we funded our archery in the schools programs, our Oklahoma uh, Scholastic Shooting Sports program, Fishing in the schools, we've, we've been able to fund all of our education programs that our director just talked about, the NAS uh, archery and the shotgun that we're, we've been doing this month. Uh, the other really neat thing is, is we get to, since we're picking the curriculum, we plug what is important at the time. Feral hogs for a while, we did youth season last year, we did, we've covered the bears, it really gives us an opportunity to focus on some Oklahoma stuff. But possibly the best thing to come out of this was we had a curriculum. We had our own curriculum. And then we rolled into a free online certification. Hunter Ed is free in Oklahoma. It will remain free in Oklahoma as far as I'm concerned. And uh, this was our first attempt at, at our online course. We did it back in 2011. Luckily, we had a great outdoor Oklahoma TV team, made our own videos, worked with the University of Central Oklahoma to make it uh, you know, a legitimate course, and uh, we cruised along with that. We needed an update. We probably, it was uh, around 15000 to do an update back in 2015, and 
while the, the, we loved the course, it had kind of run its lifespan. There are people out there that can do a whole lot better than, uh, who have the money to do a whole lot better course than us. And we figured, had our friend uh, from the NRA, and they said, hey, guess what? We've got this free course for you guys. We spent millions of dollars on it. We spent a lot of time on it. We have it endowed that it's going to last forever. We've got customer service taken care of for you. It was a no-brainer, folks. Let's, let, let's take this course that, the, that our friends at the NRA have offered for us. Um, most courses, all the other online courses in, in the U.S. cost money. You spend anywhere from $25 to $35 to actually end up getting certified. This is the free course. Um, we have ha now had probably, as of today, we're probably over 20,000. This was, this was, this was uh, last week when I was putting this together, but we've probably broken $20,000, uh, 20,000 students. Now, this is a really neat deal, 20,000 students getting a $30 to $35 value in Oklahoma, and um, where no other, that, that's not an opportunity that any of the other companies have offered. But then we got with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out in Albuquerque, and we said, hey, the, wild, the NRA is donating this, this certification for free. To us, this should be an in-kind match, the same that we do with our volunteer uh, hunter ed people or our volunteer aquatic education people. We went back and forth with the Fish and Wildlife Service for a little while, but we arrived on this $20 per student. So not only does a student get free hunter education, when they take the course, that student, with the, um, because of the free course from the NRA, is actually contributing $20 back into our conservation program so that we get to do controlled burns, food plots, and build new gun ranges for people. Now, this is the amount of money we get in. <clears throat> you match that with a 75% match or the 10% uh, or the 90% match for gun ranges, and this turns into a whole lot of money. So that brings us to we should recognize our partners with the National Rifle, uh, National Rifle Association. I don't think I need to read that to you. I can if, if you would like. It's up there. But $190,000, nearly $200,000, and this is going to keep going. We're going to um, really focus on recruiting people to our hunter education course in the next few years, and this money's just going to keep stacking up, and it's just absolutely free. So I'd like to uh, get Peter up here. <coughs> Peter, have a few words to say, or are we going to do the resolution right away? I just didn't know for sure. Oh, yeah, let's let him say a few words. <laughs> okay. Did you want to do the resolution? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Peter has um, Peter has really done a lot for us in the NRA, and, and not to mention he's a, he's a good friend of mine, so I really appreciate uh, what we've done here. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you for everything you do, commissioners, chairman, J.D., for all the residents of Oklahoma providing great opportunities to get outside and have fun. Um, we know that being outside and doing the things that we love is great, wholesome opportunities, um, and it's a great way to fill our time in our freezers. So thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here representing the NRA, and I really appreciate this opportunity to be here and this resolution and this acknowledgement. Um, there are so many people that were part of this, our foundation, all the donors that gave the money to make this course happen, um, our contracting company who is, does, works tirelessly, um, who believes in this mission to provide free, awesome hunter education online to every American. Um, but we're not the only ones to thank here. Uh, your agency and your employees saw this opportunity and capitalized on the match. When we architect this course six years ago, me and a team of people at the NRA, um, we wanted to provide an awesome free online course. We looked at the options that were available to hunters in America, and they weren't great. Um, being the organization that started hunter education back in 1949,
We wanted to reintroduce ourselves in a way that we could contribute to furthering, creating more hunters, making it easier, reducing barriers to get people into the field as fast as we could. So part of the architecture of this was we wanted this course to be additive to a state agency. We didn't want to make it look like we were taking away from anything that they already do because the, the professionals that work for the state agency know this stuff better than we do. So we wanted to make sure this course helped you all. And the match idea um, that came about organically as we developed this course was it. And we, are, we couldn't be more delighted because it was one of the top four priorities that we wanted to see take, states take advantage of. And Oklahoma has done that by far more than any other state. So we could not be happier to see the dream fulfilled. And out of this resolution and, and some of the talking that we do out of it, hopefully more states follow suit because you all are trendsetters. You're doing a great thing for conservation. So thank you again. This course is a win-win for everybody. It's a win-win for the state. and It's a win-win for the agency. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. So you want to get a, maybe a motion in a second to uh, make it official, and then we can take a picture with it? At this time, I'm going to ask for a motion to uh, action on this resolution by Brewster. Commissioner Brewster. Second. 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 Any other discussion? Roll call. Mr. Brewster. Aye. Mr. Barwick. Aye. Mr. Gaddis. Aye. Mr. Zell. Aye. Mr. Dillingham. Aye. Mr. Holder. Aye. Mr. Mabry. Aye. Hey, by the way, Locust Grove last year shot the top team store score at any state. By the way, that's what that's what Altus got done. By the way, they beat the the the, the team that topped the top state store anywhere. So. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Nels, for this presentation and uh, all the work that goes along with that. I know Lance does a great job, and we certainly appreciate that. And Peter, thank you for presenting that to, uh, to the commission. Thank you, thank you very much. So on the next item, uh, agenda item number 12, will be the update on the uh, Wildlife Commission's uh, Lands and Minerals Program. Bill Dinkins. Bill? Good morning. You all <clears throat> probably recall this was on last month's agenda item. Unfortunately, Kristen was not able to be here last month. But it was going to be a precursor to the beaver track that you all voted on last month. So. I'd still like Kristen to give this presentation. It's an overview of the lands and minerals. JD covered most of the accolades. I'm just going to add that you know Kristen is also our geographic information system or GIS supervisor, has been for a couple of years. So she supervises that staff for us. And she's a great asset not only to Wildlife Division, but the agency. So. <coughs> Good morning, my name is Kristen Gilman. I'm the Wildlife Lands and Minerals Coordinator. The Wildlife Department owns 359,489.64 surface acres. We actually only own a fraction of the minerals beneath the surface acres. We own 75,643.49 mineral acres. We have acres in 23 counties underlying 26, 23 counties, underlying 26 facilities being hatcheries and wildlife management areas. And the commissioners of the land office, often known as CLO, provide several services like agricultural leasing, 
mineral leasing, easements, and conservation services, to name a few. It is the mineral leasing the agency was most interested in partnering with the commissioners of the land office. They manage the minerals for several uh, state agencies, including Office of Management and Enterprise Services, School Land, Oklahoma State University, and the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. CLO has an entire division dedicated to minerals management. They oversee income from royalty checks. They ensure that so they compare the royalty checks to the tax commission rules to ensure correct deductions and make sure that other fees are not deducted from our lease payment. For that, CLO retains 6% of all monies remit remitted in connection with oil and gas leases as a management fee. But, so this is an overview of the mineral leasing. So unleased minerals go up for bid when someone is interested in leasing the minerals. So what happens is they contact CLO. I'll either refer them or they'll contact CLO directly. CLO will send us the nomination for ODWC review. Wildlife Division will review that request and make sure there's no conflicts or other issues that may prevent us from leasing those minerals. Then the minerals go out for public bid. One of the benefits is since CLO manages several agencies, then when they have an auction, which is every other month, they have a large group of minerals going up. They're on, uh, all the bidding is done online. Once the bids are received, CLO will send us a recommendation for either re uh, accepting or rejecting the bid. This is where we rely on CLO to know what the market price is, along with what other tracks are selling in that area for. If it is comparable, then they'll say, yes, we should accept it, if it, accept it. If it is not, they will advise us to reject the bid. The lease is for three years. If there's no production, the lease automatically terminates. If there is production, service damages are assessed by us um, through Title 800, Chapter 30, Subchapter 3, um, along with stipulations, we receive one-fifth royalty, and the lease has a depth associated with the formation that is leased. So we entered into an agreement in 2013. Um, some of the benefits of this partnership is that CLO reviewed prior um, lease production records and found that there was a company in Latimer County that had underpaid us, and so on our behalf, their minerals management division had them provide restitution of $33,218.34. Another aspect is their um, real estate division, and so they have um, appraisers that appraise for damages for CLO, and so we use those rates to compare them with our surface damage rates. And result, we found out in 2016 that we were undercharging people, and so we brought them up with a market value. <coughs> Pardon me, from the time period of December 2019 to November 20th, the department received $380,836.07. Um, it's an actual monthly average of $31,736.34. We saw a high in March of 2020 and a low in July. Does anybody have any questions? Production was a little bit down, and some of them have been had been holding it, and so they went to market in, in February. And so when they provided their um, royalty and dividends, they they came in in March. So it depends on when they actually sell that we get the money. Largest surface landowner. The largest no, surface landowner. No, we are not. School and commission has got over 700,000 acres at least that they own. This would all be government, right? Well, no. There's no private land on That are bigger than that. Than our jurisdiction, no? Uh, I, have, 
I have no idea, honestly. I mean, we just we don't it. keep tabs on yeah. private landowners. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, for that information, that update. Uh, very good information of something that I haven't seen before, and I don't know if the commissioners had as well. So thank you much for that information. Before we get into agenda item 13, I must uh, read a piece here to the commissioners. Commissioners, each of you should have received an email of information for each rule being proposed by the Wildlife Department that is on the agenda today. The email included the online comments, email and mail in comments, and oral comments received at the public hearing. At this time, I'd like to poll the members of the commission to confirm that each member has received the email or rule information from the department and has had the opportunity to review and consider the public comments submitted in connection with these proposed rules. So at this time, I'd call for a vote. Commissioner Brewster? Aye. Commissioner Barwick? Aye. Commissioner Gaddis? Aye. Commissioner Zell? Aye. Commissioner Dillingham? Aye. Commissioner Holder? Aye. Commissioner Mabry? Aye. At this time, we will uh, con uh, go through the permanent rules. At this time, Micah mm -hmm. will come up and begin the conversation. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm presenting a chapter one today. We have several revisions here. It's a uh, kind of a sorted, um, affects several different divisions. So they asked me to, to do it. Do I need to speak up? Well, they're having a hard time hearing you. You may have to drop the mask a little bit if you're comfortable with that. All right. So chapter one, um, some of the main things it does is it removes duplicative language uh, for the uh, commission that's already found in Title 29 or the Constitution. Uh, no need for it to be in Title 800 either. Uh, it changes the job title from personal personnel coordinator to human resources administrator. Uh, it updates the items that we offer for sale in the outdoor store. Uh, it updates the licensed dealer requirements to match new protocols. Uh, and and it, it reflects those changes due to licensed dealers being required to use the electronic system. We no longer have uh, paper licensed dealers anymore. Uh, it, it also allows non-residents to complete the Hunter, Hunter Education Certification course uh, through our uh, NRA course that you just heard about. And it removes the volunteer program, uh, the volunteer incentive program for the Hunter Education and Aquatic Education program that long, no longer exists. It also updates the reporting requirements uh, for those classes. Any questions? Very few comments on this is certainly no negative comments that I recall on this one um, this one's really just a lot of cleanup and housekeeping as part of Corey led our regulatory review for R3 R2 for R3 committee which was a group of folks that volunteered from all of our divisions to really pour over the rules and try to make it less complicated and as easy to understand as possible so because um, we're doing everything possible to you know, try to encourage people to get outdoors and, and not get in trouble when they do. And if it's confusing, sometimes they get in trouble unintentionally. So this is, you know, the first, and this really goes throughout all the remaining chapters as well, this largely housekeeping, cleaning, decomplicating stuff. But um, this one in particular was a pretty benign chapter relative to the fishery stuff in particular. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, the Rules Committee uh, met, considered the public uh, comments and the recommendations of department staff, and the committee uh, recommends approval, and I so move to uh, approve those rules as proposed. Nope, that was just chapter one. Yes. 
Yeah, so. It has to be on the fishery rules. Good morning. Agenda item 14 asks for your approval of fisheries rules found in Title 800, Chapter 10. These are sport fish rules. These rules are in subchapters 1, 3, and 5 related to harvest, possession, method of take, and area restriction. Um, we propose rules in all of these subchapters. Um, many of these rules, as the director described, were uh, our really first efforts at uh, aligning with Governor Stitt's uh, executive order to streamline rules, make them a little simpler. And uh, another thing that we know from some of the human dimensions work is that it, uh, it, it's an impediment to license sales when you have really complex regulations. So all of that fit in pretty well with some initiatives that we have. I was gonna touch briefly on those rules that uh, were that minor changes, mostly housekeeping, that received few or no comments. And then I know that uh, Commissioner Barwick uh, and the rest of the committee will want to talk maybe in detail about some of the others that we, we discussed. These rules, tiger muskie at Etling, we don't, even, we don't have tiger muskie at Etling anymore, so we removed those. Um, the Monday Friday paddlefish closure was something of consequence that uh, you know we didn't feel like we needed that anymore. And uh, so that one's gone close to home bag limits. Alligator gar statewide closure to help law enforcement with uh, that closure is uh, uh, it's a one fish per day and, and requires reporting, but it allows uh, uh, law enforcement to better regulate that. Um, in 1036, one that I know that Commissioner Dillingham may want to touch on, but was labeling on passive fishing gears and in other very uh, minor rule changes. Um, rules in chapter 10 that generated uh, significant comments both for and against um, I'll, I'll talk about those, but first of all, in Chapter 1014, it's the uh, bag limit on trout. That bag limit was six, and we proposed to reduce that to three after significant in-house discussion. And um, the uh, several reasons for that, I'll just touch on a few of them, but uh, trout costs have skyrocketed, nearly $5 per fish at this point, and uh, we're spending well over half a million dollars on trout annually and that we just felt like we needed to kind of take a look at that. Important to note that uh, catch and release is still allowed, so you can only keep three fish, but I mean, family of four, if you take your children out there, or grandkids, I mean, four of you can still bring home 12 fish. The, the goal of the program is not really to fill freezers with a trout that's not native to Oklahoma, and uh, so we felt like if you want to fill your freezer, go crappie fishing or, or stripers or, or catfish, but trying to uh, you know, get a handle on these, these escalating costs, main reason. Second reason on that one was that, again, the impediments to uh, selling licenses, it was already three on the Lower Mountain Fork River, so rather than go with a four or five or some other number, we decided to make that just consistent statewide. So, uh, like I say, we discussed changing this to four, a lot of comments on this rule, and uh, we ultimately lit on the, uh, the three fish limit. Is there, do you want to pause and do questions as we go on these, Mr. Chairman, or would you prefer to, as I finish, how do you want to tackle this? You might go ahead, I mean, unless you have a strong opinion, go ahead and reel through them, so to speak, and then we'll um, see if, what questions they have at the end of this sure. chapter. Yeah. Glad to do that. Thanks. Okay, the, uh, of the three that we received the most comments, um, that one was in 1014 number seven. This is 1014 number 1D. And this was the, re the proposal to require fish taken with a bow, gig, spear gun, or spear to be properly disposed of. Uh, we received comments both for and against. I would say it's, it's I mean, it's not a vote, but uh, these comments were mostly against, obviously. And uh, you'll recall uh, Jason Schooley's presentation last month about native non-game fishes. And we felt like that we had the need to increase awareness of these uh, native non-game species. To that end, during our meeting uh, earlier this month with the uh, Commission Rules Committee, we, uh, after a lot of discussion, both in-house and with the committee, 
Uh, we felt like that we would delay this rulemaking to collect additional data and implement outreach efforts, maybe do some human dimension stuff, try to establish relationships with some of these bow fishing clubs, and uh, then uh, move forward with that at a later date. And finally, in chapter 1056, it's item P, disposal of fish remains in waters of this state. Uh, this rule was originally uh, proposed to be 25 yards from boat ramps, and the language was a little bit in swimming areas, public use areas. What we, uh, after some discussion, lit on was 100 yards from a boat ramp swimming area, and uh, again, increased from, from 25 yards. So those were the three that really generated the discussion in fisheries, and I'd be glad to uh, help with discussion at this time. Any questions of the commission? It's time we'd ask. Well, Mr. Chairman, the, the Rules Committee met, as Barry alluded to. Uh, we considered the public comments and uh, recommendations of the department staff, and we recommend approval with those revisions that, that Barry de described that were different than the ones that were sent out to the general public, yeah. uh, which we think, uh, I think are more palatable at this point in time. So committee recommends approval as revised. I don't know, Chad, did you have anything you wanted to add to the, uh, the gig lines and those kind of things? I do. Uh, thank you. And thank you to the staff and for the committee for their work on this. I know it's uh, never easy. I uh, uh, sent uh, Chief Bolton a note over the weekend congratulating him for generating the most comments uh, uh, out of this exercise. <laughs> Uh, he was by far the winner on that. <clears throat> but there were a couple that um, I had calls on uh, that I uh, wanted to just ask the committee uh, and the commission for further thoughts, information, and consideration. Uh, one of those is on 1036 with regards to the, the tagging uh, with identification number versus uh, name and address as it currently is. Certainly, personally, I would uh, prefer not to have the identification number versus a name and address, but <clears throat> there's certainly uh, some that don't have uh, that uh, uh, committed to memory yet and prefer the uh, name and address approach. Given one of our goals with this is to uh, make things easier, not more complicated, uh, it seems to me that uh, maybe a solution to that, a happy middle ground, would be to have an and or in there uh, to where if those that don't have their identification number and want to include their name and address, um, that we ought to allow for that. There's really no reason uh, not to encourage everyone to start moving towards their identification number, but certainly don't want to make it harder by uh, uh, somebody not having that with them. And then the, and I'll, I just have one other. Uh, was on the uh, bag limit, daily bag limit for the trout. Uh, certainly understand the ca catch and release, uh, all the reasons behind it, the comments that the committee's made. I've had some feedback on that. The only thing I'd ask that we consider on that is once we get through the season, given the fact that we are spending a lot of money for these trout, um, that uh, we, once we get through the designated season, we uh, open it up and um, allow for no daily limit, and try and get as many of them caught and enjoyed as we can uh, once we get through the season. So those were my two uh, comments, and uh, would uh, appreciate any feedback. The uh, committee did uh, kick that around quite a bit on, on putting the address or the number, but we thought this time we're trying to steer our sportsmen into knowing that they have a number and to use that number. Uh, so that was the reason why we didn't... Uh, put a provision there on, uh, as Chad suggested, and or put their address. I mean, I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that. There's no harm in that, but we do want to steer the sportsman towards their number. Uh, and Nels, maybe you can help get that word out, that everybody does have a number. Isn't that right, Nels? And it'd be easier. You'll need a mic for the people online. Sorry. Right. Right. Uh, that was a good. That's, that's, 
something that we talked about as far as um, as far as that goes, to, to get the word out on, on ID number, there are some people that don't know their ID number. They can call us and we'll get them their ID number. Um, Cliff also mentioned the um, wildlife side on the wildlife rules. I believe it was last year changed uh, or required the ID number on um, deer stands, blinds, cameras, and central and wildlife management areas. Doesn't that make it easier on the controlled hunts if you have your ID number? put in for those controlled hunts? If not, maybe it should be. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that offhand. Um, I know in talking to the law enforcement folks that the ID number is an easy look up in our system. I mean, if you have somebody's ID number, you can immediately find out what kind of fishing license they have, if they have a fishing license, etc. The name and address is not as easy of a look up. So that's another thing that we should mention. I uh, appreciate that and understand that. And anyone who has a phone uh, and downloads your app and uh, syncs it with their license will have that ID number there readily available. Uh, again, just under the auspice of trying to make things as user-friendly as possible, um, having the and or, uh, I would uh, like to see it entertained as an amendment on that. Mr. Barwick, did, did you want to amend that or have? Yes, I'll amend that and include that in my motion to approve uh, the rules as recommended by staff. With yes. What well, we we come up with rules every year, so we can always change them. <laughs> well, I. I do think that that's a good point in having some kind of a sunset or moving towards that, just giving a, a, uh, a period of time uh, to make it as easy as possible on a transition. I think that makes sense. So I don't, you know, whether you want to look at it every year or put a three-year sunset or something like that, uh, probably makes sense. Mr. Do you have something, Nate? Are you going to say what I was thinking in my head, which is about soft enforcement at first? I was just going to say that um, any time we pass new rules for 800, dealing with any kind of law enforcement issues, we usually take it pretty easy for the first two, three years before we start enforcing. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I recall having this discussion with the wildlife rules last year and what it, you know how hard are the wardens going to be on people that still put their name and address on because they haven't heard they have to have their ID. And I haven't heard that we've had anybody getting busted for not doing it right this past year. We, we would take it really easy for a long time. And honestly, most of those guys are going to have a name and address on them for a while anyway. So, you know, that fades off. They can put their number on there. Like Nels mentioned earlier, it is an easier law enforcement issue for us to type in an ID number for a search instead of typing in a name and a last name and going through three pages of results trying to look for the right county. So. Yeah. They, when they put J.L. Smith from Oklahoma City, you're going, yeah. uh, which the 300 J. Smiths is it? But that's, you know, again, I, the commission's going to ultimately decide what you want to do on this. Either way, we can make it work. I just wanted that information to be out there as well. You have the opportunity to, you know, put something in place now, and then it's sort of slowly integrated and enforced over time, which is typically the case. Well, I think, I think we should make it as easy for the department and the sportsmen. So what's everybody suggest on that? And while you're making an amendment or considering an amendment, um, in addition to that, um, we might want to also discuss the, uh, since we're spending so much money for trout, uh, once we get through the season, uh, you know, how we would address opening that up with no limit uh, on anything caught after a certain date. So, right, after the, well, uh, really, uh, there's no reason, they're going to die anyway, so we might as well fill freezers with, uh, let, you know, the citizens enjoy it. Well, like I said, we, we propose rules every year, so uh, if we keep the way that fisheries has suggested, then we can relook at it next year. 
fishery see any problem with that? The one challenge I can think of, and then you can jump in, but again, we were going for consistency was part of this. So we went to a three fish limit on the mountain fork. Um, and so if we did three fish limit everywhere, it makes it easier. The consistency side of this one is um, like we would not want to impose a free for all on the lower mountain fork where they're fishing for trout year round or on the lower Illinois. I would imagine we'd want to keep limits in place. So it might be challenging for people to figure out where can I fish no holds barred and where do I have to make sure I can only keep three trout. But that's just one challenge that comes to my mind. Barry, what do you what do you think? Yeah, Director Strong, I the JD mentioned that the two year round trout fisheries are the lower mountain fork below Broken Bow and the lower Illinois below Ten Killer. Uh, every one of our other fisheries with a few exceptions, apparently a few fish probably over summer at Watonga because of the stream and the spring up there, but uh, it's insignificant. So we've got two year-round and the rest of our trout fisheries are, are winter time only so those fish do not survive the summer I get I get your point though I mean it's a it's kind of a creative solution opportunity I just don't know like at what date would you impose that because some people are still fishing for trout and catching them past what you would expect depending on what the weather is that year and the stream flow and all that stuff so Director, it, uh, yes, it all depends on the weather. You know, usually sometime in April into May, uh, a lot of those fish are still out there. And water temperatures, it's interesting because rainbow trout, the, the, the idea was that 70 degrees that they start to, you know, s significant mortality. But what we've seen is we believe that some of these trout, uh, this Emerson strain of trout that we're getting from the commercial producer, we know that they do pretty well up to 75, 78 degrees, so these trout are starting to live a little longer out there, but probably by June, July, you've lost almost all of them, the temperature. And one thing about trout, they do tend to sink, uh, so you don't really see a massive die-off, and there probably are fish that are dying, but you don't always see that. than the year round would you see a problem with say anything after May 1st uh, and all other areas being uh, open no limit you know I, I guess I'd, I'd ask this question I mean we, we can do something like that but that did not go to public hearings so I mean we'd kind of be taking a step out there that the public has not had an opportunity to comment on but I mean somebody helped given me the with. comments you did have though I can't imagine that the public would have yeah. any issue this is what their whole point yeah, that, that would be your opportunity to fill the freezer. Like a lot of people said, I'm not going to go because I can't put trout in the freezer. I'm not <laughs> but there's a reason why he can't go outside those boundaries because other people would have comments if that particular case came to us and proved that. that. That's why you don't do that. No, good point. Well. Yeah, I made a motion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Clayton, did you, I mean, have anything to say about that last point about AP, the APA yeah, process? We, we didn't propose that rule. And if it, if it comes up, they might want to move past those boundaries and go to those creatures. Well, well, here's what I can, I mean, envision could happen. You could have, you know, a fly fisherman that still fishes the Blue River the second week of May and all of a sudden it, there's the worm and bobber trout has descended on on the Blue River and, and there's no opportunity for that catch and release fly fisherman anymore but they usually are when you're trying to take yeah. something away from them. Well, I, I've made my point on that. I just think that if we're going to invest that kind of money, uh, I'd rather it go to good use versus waste. But we can certainly address that uh, at a future time and a future year. I think we ought to look at that and kind of figure out what month that mortality occurs. And yeah. uh, I think it gives us an opportunity to kind of figure that one out and put it on the list for next year maybe. I guess to revise my motion to change um, – 10-3-6 to allow 
uh, sportsmen can put their name and address uh, and or their uh, ID number. For the next three years, is that what I also heard? And then that's what everybody wants. Three years, yeah, for a three-year period. Can we do a sunset on a rule? Basically, yeah. Okay. And then, then we drop those off, and it'll just be the sportsman's ID number. So, so moved. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Um, second. Second. Any further discussion? There be none. Roll call, please. Commissioner Brewster. Aye. Commissioner Carwin. Aye. Commissioner Gaddis. Aye. Commissioner Zell. Aye. Commissioner Dillingham. Aye. Commissioner Holder. Mr. Mabry. Aye. On item number 15, uh, chapter 15, commercial harvest rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The agenda item 15 asks for your approval of fisheries rules found in chapter 15. Uh, basically, these proposals would remove rules pertaining to commercialization of Oklahoma's aquatic resources. These rules have been in place for some time. Simplification of rules but basically uh, includes waters of this state, which is defined in 29, and would include uh, fish, minnows, shad, and mussels, commercial fishing for those. I think it's important to point out that we have had no active commercial fishermen, that's what we call them, commercial anglers, or mussel pickers uh, at this time. Uh, the commercial fishing goes back a long ways, and I can recall, J.D. loves to point this out, I've been around for a few years, but uh, I can recall when the last of those commercial fishermen had licenses. Eufaula, I think, was the very last one, but some of these old families, uh, it, they would set gill nets out there, and uh, most of the fish that they took uh, were sport fish rather than the fish they were supposed to be taking, and it created some issues with, with sport fish anglers. And uh, we have issued no commercial fishing licenses, I know, since, gosh, for 20 years. And mussel picking was big for a very short period of time, selling Oklahoma mussels when the, uh, they were using pieces of those muscle, mussel shells to uh, implant in oysters to create pearls. And uh, that market has pretty much died off. So we, uh, are, we're proposing to strike those commercial fishing rules and uh, kind of avoid this problem in the future. And got very few comments on that. There, Commissioner, there, let's, let's touch on the commercial uh, minnow harvest. There, I believe, are two, one or two left, and uh, it's, it's very small uh, compared to what it used to be. But the biggest single issue there and what led us to include minnows in this was that because with the interbasin transfer of those different species, because when they're out there saning those minnows and sell them to the mom and pop bait shop, you end up with a whole bunch of Asian carp, a whole bunch of other things in there that you, it's difficult even for us to identify some of these fish. And uh, so we felt like that was such a minor part of commercial fishing anymore that we should go ahead and include that in there. So you did have one, James Gilreath, in the southwest part of the state. And uh, he was, a, a, both of you may know him, Commissioner Zelps. Uh, very vocal at the time, but I have not heard from Mr. Gilreath in five to ten years. Chairman, the Rules Committee met uh, on those particular rules and considered the public comments and staff recommendations, and the committee recommends approval as proposed of those rules. I so move. Motion second. 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 Discussion? Roll call, please. Commissioner Brewster? Aye. Commissioner Barwick? Aye. Commissioner Gaddis? Aye. Commissioner Zelt? Aye. Commissioner Dillingham? Aye. Commissioner Holder? Aye. Commissioner Mabry? Aye. Mr. Chairman, in closing, I would just like to say that my staff and I have made a conscious decision that in the next cycle of rulemaking, we're going to hand that hot seat back to Bill and the wildlife <laughs> folks. Uh, <laughs> this is an unenviable un position for us. Well navigated, though, Skipper. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is consideration vote to take further action on permanent rules uh, in the wildlife area. Uh, Mr. Bill Dinkins. Bill? Thank you very much. Well, I guess we'll find out here in a minute, but so far I kind of like how this is going. Um, 
So, as you all know, there's a number of changes that were proposed in Chapter 25. Um, just to kind of echo what Barry said, you know, the, the task that we were given was to try to find ways to simplify, um, remove duplicative, outdated rules. So that's part of the reason why we have, what, three or three and a half pages here of items. What I can tell you is, you know, based on the comments that we did receive and discussions with staff, um, staff is not recommending that we make any changes to these rules in Chapter 25. In other words, we're asking for you to approve them as submitted. And I'll be glad to ask, I mean, uh, instead of going through some, like page six, there's a whole page of explanation there that I'm sure you all have read, but if you have any questions, I'd be glad to, to address them. might just uh, make a comment that on the comments in this section, uh, certainly don't have any problem with uh, the recommendations, but one of the things I was uh, kind of struck by and I think we ought to always be sensitive to on the commission is uh, comments of access and ability to hunt, and it's kind of one of the reasons why on the uh, we've been pushing back on uh, the limitation of the commission to buy additional public lands and access because uh, we need to have, um, with such a small percentage of land in the state being um, uh, publicly available. Uh, and there was a lot of comments about, you know, uh, whether it's waterfowl or whether it's deer hunting or this, that, and the other access and the ability to get out with uh, a lot of the uh, guides that are you know coming in and taking up a lot of the public or excuse me private land uh, and having access. So I just I, my only point in saying this at this time is I am sensitive to those comments that were made, and I think it's something that we always need to be looking at as far as access to uh, public for our constituents. I agree, and we just so for the record, we did uh, as we went through those comments. There's several of them that we did take note of, and I've already. I don't see Laura here anymore, but I, if you noticed her name on a couple of them, I've already spoke with her about her comments. So there are some things maybe not on this agenda that we're going to address today, but we will look at a little deeper. Mr. Chairman, the Rules Committee met, considered the public comments and staff recommendations. So we recommend approving the rules as is. I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, we're opening up uh, Hackberry Flat and Sandy Sanders to muzzle loading for deer, and it was amazing the number of comments that kind of questioned that. I mean, some people kind of wanted to keep it the way it was, and of course, some people like to open it up. And I think we're all more for more opportunity for everybody. So that's right. that's where we're headed. So I make a motion that uh, we approve the uh, rules in, in Chapter 25 as proposed. The motion on the floor. Second. Second. Dealt. Okay. Any further discussion? Vote on uh, Title 800, Chapter 25, Wildlife Rules. Roll call, please. Mr. Bruce. Aye. Mr. Barwick. Mr. Gaddis. Aye. Mr. Zell. Aye. Mr. Dillingham. Aye. Mr. Holder. Aye. Mr. Mabry. Aye. Next item is um, agenda item 17, uh, Title 800, Chapter 30. Department of Wildlife Lands Management. Bill. Yes, sir. So a much smaller list here on Chapter 30. Uh, similar uh, scenario. The, the thing we did notice was on the hog hunting rules for those select WMAs, the closure uh, to support uh, wildlife services in their hog eradication. Uh, there was quite a few comments opposing shutting down ho hog hunting on those WMAs and um, I can understand why. I mean, if, if you don't understand why we did it to support uh, wildlife services in those efforts, it, it really doesn't make any sense. So I, I suspect that's why we had so many opposed to closing feral hog hunting on those WMAs, but as we've heard from uh, Scott Alls last month, uh, it's part of a bigger plan to eradicate hogs, so I still believe it's the best move. Bill, I got the impression from the public comments on that that they didn't really understand what we were doing on those areas yes. with that study and, and uh, 
so I, I don't know if we need to get more communication out on that or not. But Hope from the public comments, it didn't sound like they knew that that's why why we we're closing. I agree. Yeah, I'll work with Nails on that one. Get that fixed. Mr. Chairman, uh, the Rules Committee met and have considered the public comments and also staff recommendation on those rules in Chapter 30 and uh, recommend approval, and I so move for approval as proposed. Okay, motion second. Second. Discussion? There being none, roll call, please. Commissioner Brewster? Aye. Commissioner Barwick? Aye. Commissioner Gaddis? Aye. Commissioner Self? Aye. Commissioner Dillingham? Aye. Commissioner Holder? Mr. Mabry. Aye. Well, Barry, he got through his rules in shorter time than it took you to clear your throat. <laughs> First of all, I think I'd like to thank uh, the Rules Committee uh, for taking the time to, to go through these rules and the consolidation of those rules and want to thank the staff and all team members involved in that because I'm sure that took a great amount of time but it certainly looked like it's worthwhile in reducing a lot of the uh, language and information there so thank everybody for that under new business uh, discussion of any matter not known about or which could not have been reasonably be, uh, foreseen 24 hours prior to this scheduled meeting there being none, uh, announce, uh, announce the next date or a regular commission meeting will be April 5th, the day before turkey season, 2021 at 9 a.m. in the office here in Oklahoma City. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, before everybody sprints, I just wanted to remind commissioners that we've got our IT staff here to help um, set your mobile devices up in the new email environment if you want to take advantage of that before you leave. Thank you. <laughs> you want to get your e your commission email on your phone or something, our IT folks. Oh, yeah. Well, it hasn't changed. We it's just changed migrated. in the last week. We yeah. just migrated to a new system, and y'all. that's why y'all did just yeah. my email. So we'll have to change that. So... They're fixing your, your regular commission emails now and they can get them put back on your phone in the new system. Or where? They're, they're yes. here today to help you do that in IT. I'll go get them and bring them in here. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Meetings adjourned. Thank you.